Thanks to all of you, there's an important new memorial on the Mall in Washington, D.C. The National World War II Memorial. Designed by Friedrich St. Florian, it creates a special place to commemorate the sacrifice and celebrate the victory of World War II. At the same time, it enhances a space that is already special, our National Mall. The memorial covers more than seven acres two-thirds of it landscaping and water. It's built of bronze and granite, some 17,000 pieces of granite from South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, California, and Brazil. The memorial commemorates the battles of World War II and the people who fought them. But it's much more than a memorial to hardship and gunfire sacrifice and heroism. It's a celebration of the spirit that brought all Americans together. Black and white, Native American and first generation immigrant, soldier and factory worker. On the battlefront and on the home front. They've been called the greatest generation that ever lived and Americans everywhere have helped create this memorial to say thank you. Come with me and discover the special significance that's built into the granite and bronze of this memorial. We'll enter by the ceremonial walkway that leads from 17th Street. To your left and right, you'll see flagpoles. The base of each flagpole bears an inscription and the seals of the military services and merchant marine. Inset in the balustrades to your left and right are 24 sculptured bronze panels by Raymond Caskey, whose studio created all the sculpture for the memorial. The 12 on the north, to your right, depict the Atlantic front. The 12 on the south show the Pacific front. Most of the panels were inspired by historical photos. They depict not just battles, but the all-out mobilization of America's agricultural, industrial, military, and human resources that ultimately led to victory. When you reach the Memorial Plaza, you'll see a restored and improved rainbow pool with its historic fountains working again for the first time in decades. Embracing the plaza are 56 pillars that represent each of the individual states, territories, and the District of Columbia. The pillars are joined together by a bronze rope that symbolizes the bonding of the nation in a common cause. Two bronze wreaths, one of oak and one of wheat, symbolize America's role as both the arsenal of democracy and the breadbasket of the world. To the right and left are two memorial pavilions, each 43 feet high. The South Pavilion commemorates the war in the Pacific, and the North, the war in the Atlantic. In each pavilion, four bronze columns support American eagles that hold a suspended laurel wreath to memorialize the victory of the World War II generation. On the floor of each pavilion is the World War II Victory Medal. Beyond the Rainbow Pool, you'll see the Freedom Wall. Here we mark the price of freedom. A field of 4,000 sculpted gold stars commemorates the more than 400,000 Americans who gave their lives. The gold star has its own history. During the war, blue stars were displayed to indicate family members serving in uniform. The stars changed to gold when a loved one was lost. The pillars closest to the Freedom Wall, occupying places of honor, represent the original 13 states. The rest are ranked in the order in which they achieved statehood or became part of the United States. Every element of the World War II memorial works to a single purpose, 
eloquently expressed in the engraving of the announcement stone we passed at the ceremonial entrance. Here in the presence of Washington and Lincoln, one the 18th century father and the other the 19th century preserver of our nation. We honor those 20th century Americans who took up the struggle during the Second World War and made the sacrifices to perpetuate the gift our forefathers entrusted to us. A nation conceived in liberty and justice. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Terry. I'm a uh, member of the Board of Directors for the Friends of the National World War II Memorial. And I also happen to have been the project manager for the general contractor that built the memorial. So uh, I thought I'd uh, give you a little tour today and give you some of my insights into the memorial and some of my memories and, and things like that. And, and hopefully uh, you'll find it interesting and enjoyable. So we're starting here at the 17th Street entrance uh, by the announcement stone, uh, which kind of gives some context to the memorial uh, in terms of the 20th century. We're here um, between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial uh, uh, representing the, you know, the Civil War, the Washington Monument obviously talking about uh, Washington and the, the Revolutionary War, the two biggest events in the, the 18th and 19th centuries. And then here between them is the World War II Memorial, which most historians consider the most significant event of the 20th century. So it's, it gives it nice context here where it's located. Um, this is one of the biggest stones on the memorial. It's one huge block of granite. Um, it was, uh, it's made out of, uh, what's called Greene County Granite, which was quarried in uh, Greene County, Georgia, uh, close to Atlanta. Um, all of the uh, horizontal stones, most of the horizontal stones, the paver stones in the memorial are Greene County Granite from, uh, from Georgia. Um, so that's kind of the announcement as you enter into the, to the 17th Street entrance of the memorial. And uh, why don't we, Head down and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share a few other things with you. So as you, as you walk into the memorial, you'll notice along the north and south wall, uh, these bas-relief panels, bronze bas-relief panels. Uh, they were sculpted uh, by a fellow named Ray Kasky, an artist who's actually local here. Uh, it took him several years uh, using uh, human models in his studio uh, to depict the various scenes, um, you know, that represent different aspects of, of World War II and that, that time period in our history. Um, as you go down, you can see uh, different, different events, uh, you know, people identify with different, different uh, scenes, uh, but they kind of tell a story as you, as you walk down into the memorial, and it's quite, quite fascinating. I'm not an expert on these panels. I just, I just helped install them. My Ray Kasky could give you some really good insight, and hopefully one of these days, maybe he'll come down and, and do a tour for people. But uh, yeah, very interesting. Here's one in particular. This is the the uh, you know talking about Rosie the Riveter and all the work back on the home front. You can see Rosie there riveting on the side of a plane. Um, um, so. Just very interesting and, and extremely well done. All these scenes were, were modeled by human actors um, over a period of years. Um, it was touch and go whether or not he'd be able to complete them all before the memorial was dedicated in 2004. And he was installing the last of the panels a couple weeks before dedication. So he made it uh, just under the wires. Okay, so as we enter the memorial proper here, um, you can see, you know, we have two large arches, one in the north, which really represents the Atlantic or European theater, and then another one in the south, which uh, represents the Pacific theater, the two uh, primary theaters of the, of the war. And then flanking those uh, pavilions are 56 uh, granite columns. Each one represents 
a state or territory of the United States at the time of uh, World War II, people often ask, how did you decide in what order they go? And they're actually in the order that they became a part of the Union, the United States. So if you look on the, the, the very first one on the left is Delaware, and then it alternates back and forth. The second state admitted to the Union was Pennsylvania over here, and then New Jersey, then Georgia. So that's how they determined the, the order of them. Um, you heard me mention earlier that the majority of the paver stones are from Georgia. The vertical stones are a, a, a granite called Kershaw granite, which is out of a quarry in South Carolina. Um, so by cubic volume, most of the stone came from that quarry in uh, South Carolina, Kershaw, South Carolina, uh, if, if you find that interesting. Uh, some of the some of the paving stones, I mentioned most of them came from Georgia, but the green paving stones you see there, there's two different colors of it, and both of those came from Brazil. Uh, Brazil just happens to have a lot of uh, nice green granites, not, not a lot of that in the United States, so we had to go to Brazil to get to get those. So the primary feature of the memorial in the center here is the rainbow pool, which, which existed since the 20s, uh, it was originally built in conjunction with the Lincoln Reflecting Pool. Uh, this rainbow pool is a, a replica of the original rainbow pool. It's the exact same shape. It's just slightly smaller to allow for, for the uh, arches and, and pillars uh, on the uh, north and the south. And it's obviously a little bit lower now. It's, it's sunken down into it, but it's, it's uh, paying respect to what was originally here, which is the, the rainbow pool is what it's, what it's called. So we talked about the pillars and how they represented the, the states and territories of the United States during the war. And you'll notice that in between each of those pillars is a, is a bronze rope. And it, you know, it, it goes continuously around the memorial. And that was meant to represent the unity of the country during World War II and how we all banded together for a common goal to defeat our enemies. And then uh, the other symbolism on these rampart walls is you can see the, the wreaths, the bronze wreaths that are hanging from the pillars. They're alternating uh, oak and wheat wreaths. So the oak is meant to symbolize uh, our military and industrial might. And then the wheat wreaths are meant to symbolize our agricultural might or, or the, you know, the breadbasket of the world as we've, as we've been known. Some of the interesting construction uh, challenges. Um, so you can see the, the ropes are, uh, are made from bronze and they intersect stone, two different materials. So uh, it was very challenging to get that exactly correct. So each one of the ropes is slightly different because when you cast bronze, it shrinks at different rates and, and things like that. So each one of those stones on either side is custom cut to fit each and every one of the, the bronze sculptures. So those were done uh, off-site at a facility. The, the bronze was cast in Joseph, Oregon, and then they were assembled inside the granite window that you see uh, at uh, New England Stone in Providence, Rhode Island. So a lot of people worked very hard to make sure that that all looked perfect. And it's one of my favorite details on the memorial because it was it was difficult to achieve, and I think uh, a lot of people worked hard to, to have a really excellent outcome on that. So we walk over to the, to the north uh, pavilion here, and you can see within the pavilion, uh, you have what's known as the Baldacchino sculpture, which is uh, four bald eagles holding a ribbon in their mouth, which is holding a laurel wreath over top of a replica of the World War II Victory Medal, which was given to each serviceman uh, that uh, fought in the war. That's actually the, the medal is in the floor of the pavilion. But this sculpture was also um, sculpted by Ray Caskey. All of these works of art were sculpted by Ray Caskey. Um, this 
piece was cast by a company called Laren Bronze up in Pennsylvania. They did a fantastic job. It's beautiful. They flew. They we had to lower the uh, each individual eagle down through the oculus in the top of the pavilion. You can see the hole in the top of the pavilion is called an oculus. Uh, each one was lowered down into place, and then the wreath was lowered down last. It was all connected here in the field uh, on site, and they had to uh, apply the patina here in the field to get everything to blend in. It was. It was a very impressive operation uh, with Ray Caskey and Laren Bronze. They did a very nice job. Um, so some of the other construction details, the largest stone on the project is actually this stone right here. It's called the balcony stone. Uh, it's the lower piece of the balcony. It's one carved out of one block of granite. Um, I don't remember how heavy it is, but it's very heavy. Uh, I wish I had the, uh, the number off the top of my head, but it was the heaviest and largest stone on the project. Let's go ahead and make our way to kind of the penultimate location in the memorial, which is uh, what we call the Wall of Stars. Um, so the Wall of Stars is meant to commemorate all the American lives that were lost uh, during World War II. Uh, it's a field of over 4,000 gold stars and the symbolism with the gold star as you know uh, when a service member uh, is killed in action um, their family would uh, display a gold star in their window the, it's where the term gold star mother comes from uh, if they have a veteran in the family during the war they, they'll hang a banner that has a blue star on it but then if, if the, the family member perishes then it, and it becomes a gold star so that's that's what these represent. Over 4,000 gold stars represent 100 each. So it, the uh, United States lost over 400,000 people in World War II, and these stars are meant to represent uh, those lives that were lost. Um, these stars were cast uh, along with the panels that they are affixed to by um, a foundry in Joseph, Oregon. Um, did a very nice, nice job on this as well. One of the interesting things uh, about the construction, if you'll notice the, uh, the waterfalls that flank on either side of the Wall of Stars, you know, the noise is, is, is you know, it's meant to drown out you know other distractions so that you can kind of reflect while you're here and and the water is meant to be soothing um, when we originally built the waterfalls uh, it was one continuous uh, weir across the face um, and it had the opposite of the desired effect because air would get trapped behind the water and it would make this awful sound it sounded like a helicopter but womp 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 and it was just extremely distracting. So uh, working with the design team, we had to come up with something different so they wouldn't do that. And then we added these weir blocks uh, you see there. So now you have, you have five different individual weirs instead of one big one and an airspace in between them so you don't have that womp womp sound. So one of the elements of the memorial that kind of came up as we were completing construction was kind of an interesting uh, nod towards the the veterans of of world war ii which was the addition of kilroy which if you're a world war ii veteran you know exactly who that is kilroy uh was an a uh a uh i guess it started out he was a quality inspector back here in the states um you know uh inspecting different military goods and things like that before they went overseas and and he would mark on things that he inspected kilroy was here so over here you can see um, Kilroy made it made it into the memorial. So Kilroy was here and he, he inspected everything and, and uh, that means we're, we did a good job, I think. <laughs> I love it when I come here. I, it brings back so many memories for one thing. Even the beginning here tells the story before we got into the war and then after we got into it 
And then over here on the other side, it tells what it was like during the war. And when I when I get here, I just I practically melt every time. And I've been here probably hundreds of times, and I still just feel like all these guys that are buried overseas come back to life when I get here. And it it it's just hard to describe. It's something that I guess I guess you have to live it. To, to understand it. But it's just a full story from the beginning clear to the end. And that's the beautiful part of it to me. When I see the stars over there across the way, uh, it, it just does something to me. And I just love it. I love it. You know? uh, as I told you before, I, if I could set up a tent, I would and live out here. This is the kind of tank I was on. This is the front end of it, and this is the rear end of it over here. And we were always with the infantry. My unit supported the infantry. And of course, here's the infantry walking along next to us. And of course, we were happy to have them around us because they could tell us if any problems were ahead that we would want to be get up there and try to knock them out for them. But they were, I mean, that, that was just part of the whole thing. It was always like this, always a bunch of GIs as close as they could get to the tanks. They really didn't like to have tanks, but they wanted them. I know that's hard to figure out, but they tanks drew fire. They didn't like that, but they loved to be able to have that gun backing them up. And that's, that's my favorite scene, but there's others along here too. The famous meeting of the Russians at Torgau. GI is coming across the broken bridge, meeting the Russians. That was a famous thing when they met up with the Russians. We were further north of, of them, and uh, the Elba River was what they crossed. Now, we weren't supposed to cross the Elba River, theoretically, because that was the dividing line between the Russians and the British, the American, and French. But for some reason, they wanted us to get across the, the Elba River. So we went from Dusseldorf, Germany, over to a town of Blackita, and uh, had a bridge built there. I remember General Matthew Ridgeway was standing out on that bridge, raising the devil, wanting the engineers to get that bridge up so we could get across it. Like I say, we couldn't figure out why they wanted us to go across the Old River, because that was the dividing line between the Russians and us. We found out later the Russians wanted to take over Denmark. We had to block them from doing that. And it's funny. I've met people here at the monument from Denmark. And I told them that story. They didn't know it. They said, well, thank you for saving my country from the Russians. Well, that's pretty nice. I, I, I met so many people from foreign countries here, even Russians. I've, I've been on Russian TV. I've been on uh, Chinese TV, uh, I, I, French, German, uh, every country in, in, in Europe. I've been on a TV program all interviewing me about this kind of stuff. And I've met so many nice people here. Of course, they're all patriotic or they wouldn't be here, and I guess that's the thing we had in common. I even met one man here who was a, who was a German who thanked me for, for what I did in Germany. And I said, well, wait a minute, we flattened your country. He said, I know. He said, but you did what we wanted to done the most. We got rid of our problems. First time a German had ever said that to me, and I spent 10 years in Germany. And I never met a German who had ever said that to me before. And so that meant a lot to me. Uh, you know, if, 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 if this thing gets to people, that's great. That's, that's, that's what we wanted to do. Hey, I was here for the dedication of the monument. And uh, it was hot. It was in May. I remember that. It was hot, terribly hot. And they had seats all the way from here right here at the edge of the, the monument, all the way up to the Washington Memorial. And it was just jammed with people, veterans, and their, and their wives. And they had big TV sets up here so that you could see what was going on on the, on the main program. And they played World War II music. And my wife and I got up and danced in the aisles of the seats over here. Before long, we had other, a whole bunch of other couples dancing in the seats waiting for the, for the ceremony to start. 
Oh, we had more fun that day. It was just a beautiful, warm, hot day that we loved it every minute of it. Yeah, well, what, last summer I was over here by the Battle of the Bulge, which is not too far from right here, uh, and uh, this couple walked up to me and the lady said that her father had been in World War II and, and uh, that he was still alive, but uh, very sick, very old. And after she left, well, her husband walked up to me and this guy must have been six foot six anyway. And he was a big, broad shouldered guy. And he walked up, and he stuck his hand out to shake my hand. And he said, My father was killed during the Battle of the Bulge. And he moved toward me like that, put his arms around me, and knocked me backwards and hugged me. And he was just crying like a baby. And I mean, we were both crying now. But it was really something to, to see this. I mean, to know that you you got to a person and, and how you did it, you don't know, but but the fact is you you reached out and got them. And I think that's a that's the thing that I like about being here. So many people walk up to you and want to tell you about their father or their brother or their uncle or something. All you have to do is listen to them, and then they want to know what you did, you know. And, and it's just just an un it's almost indescribable, the feeling.